Welcome to Fortress on a Hill. I'm Henry. I'm Danny. I'm Kagan. We're three leftist veterans that aim to expose the reality of the U.S. military's multiple wars abroad and to illuminate the damage military service does to Americans. American presidents throughout U.S. history have used American military and diplomatic power to force regime change of democratically elected governments around the world. Most veterans come from families vested in prior service, and American generals choose their own, ensuring diversity of thought never interferes with American warmongering. How can we stand by and do nothing while our military kills and destroys lives the world over, while telling Americans that all this death and destruction protects them from terrorists when nothing could be more false? Fortress on a Hill aims to change that. Well, all right, everybody, uh, listeners, we have another great pod today uh, and another awesome guest. We've we've really been on fire, uh, as you may have noticed, just been scheduling awesome people, and we're, we're so thankful that they've been coming on. Today, we have uh, Mr. Gareth Porter, who uh, many of you uh, may know, may have followed uh, or read his stuff. If, uh, if you haven't, hopefully this pod kind of, you know, opens that up to you and uh you know gareth i just want to say that i think it's standard practice in any like interviewing community to tell all your guests that uh that you're a fan but uh <laughs> but i actually am a, a long time fan and that and that's true and uh I, we met uh for the first time uh at the tabard inn uh, if right. you remember, right. uh, which I don't even remember what year that was. I mean, time stopped. Uh, yeah, with a the couple quarantine. years ago, I guess. <laughs> right. It was uh, an event with uh, our, our mutual uh, friend Fritzy at yeah. the Tabard Inn in D.C. Uh, of all things, I was there giving a two-day sort of talk on the American Revolution, <laughs> you know, and, and, and its 18th century relevance to today. And uh, and you showed up and it was it was pretty cool and, and exciting. And you know, ever since then, obviously, I've still been doing the history as analogy thing, although cautiously, but I have been a longtime follower. You know, I think that you're one of those figures, and there are so many in in the media space today, who should be daily, you should be a daily face, you know, on CNN, or <laughs> MSNBC. And, and that's difficult to do. And, uh, and it's not common. And yet, you know, we don't often get those voices like yours in that sort of mainstream press. I mean, obviously you've broken through on Slits and uh, just to give the very briefest of bios uh, for the listeners who don't know, uh, uh, Gareth Porter is an independent investigative journalist. Uh, He's covered national security policy for decades, really, uh, and was the recipient of the 2012 Gellhorn Prize for Journalism, specifically for his coverage of the U.S. war in Afghanistan. Uh, He is a graduate of uh, the University of Illinois, Chicago, and Cornell. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Got uh, at Cornell. Yeah. Right. PhD at Cornell in Southeast Asian Studies, which is uh, interesting and relevant. Uh, yeah. Much of his early work as a scholar and, dare I say, activist surrounded the American War in Vietnam and, and the region. Uh, and he was, in fact, a chairman of the Committee of Concerned Asian Scholars at Cornell, then a Saigon bureau chief within the country in 1977 and I believe, um, especially since 2005, though uh, he's regularly reported on political, diplomatic, and military developments in the Middle East for a variety of mainstream and alternative publications. Uh, he's written uh, several books. Uh, some previous highlights include The Perils of Dominance, Imbalance of Power, and the Road to War in Vietnam, and Manufactured Crisis, The Untold Story of the Iran Nuclear Scare. Uh, among many others. His most recent is uh, the CIA Insider's Guide to the Iran Crisis, co-authored with John Kierkegaard. Uh, Currently, he has a column that you absolutely must follow uh, at the Gray Zone, which I think is one of the best alternative outlets available for readers today. I've been a Max Blumenthal fan for a long time, and I've really been enjoying your columns there. So, Gareth, just once again, we're super excited to have you, and and thanks for taking the time uh, in these crazy moments. Well, thanks so much, Danny. I'm really happy to be on your show and, and glad to have the connection with Keegan as well. And, um, you know, look forward to a great, uh, great discussion with you guys. Um, I know this is a this is a good place 
to uh, to get into uh, a much more uh, well grounded and uh, uh, complex discussion of the problem of of American of the American uh, national security state, the, the military industrial congressional complex, whatever you wish to call it, and uh, and we share that that uh, deep interest in, in in this problem. And I think this could be a, a great opportunity to compare notes and, and, uh, you know, learn from one another. Absolutely. You know, we, we here on, you know, Forest on a Hill, you know, the, the three of us are veterans. Um, you know, Kagan was in Navy intelligence with some work in, with, you know, the NSA. Um, Henry was military police, did it in Iraq. And of course, I did Iraq and Afghanistan with, you know, CAV units. And the, the point is that, you know, we were sort of water carriers for the empire, right? Tools of the national security state that we're going to talk about for quite some time. And, and so we do have a lot of listeners who are veterans, although not exclusively. But it t- the, the system, right, the systemic part, you know, not acting like history began yesterday uh, is, is really important to us, I think, because we were part of that. So... Before digging into, you know, any specifics in your recent columns and books, which I'm sure you talk about a lot, and some of the subjects you're perhaps best known for covering, uh, we'd like to talk, uh, especially but not exclusively in the midst of this COVID pandemic, about the broader subject that you mentioned of American national security strategy or lack thereof. Uh, In our scheduling messages, you know, you mentioned that you're working on a forthcoming project or book eventually that you're thinking of titling national security as a racket. Um, Obviously that's a play on my longtime, you know, soulmate Smedley Butler's short book from the 1930s war is a racket, right? About his 30 or so years in the banana wars, et cetera. Uh, You you also said uh, in our conversation, I think rather correctly that the old definition of national security as practiced since world war II is now dead in the water and demands kind of a completely new concept to replace it. So perhaps as a broad opening to our discussion today, uh, you can start with, you know, three things, but I can review them uh, after each part. But essentially, if you can review the old national security consensus, such as it was, and then, you know, explain why you think it's obsolete and what evidence you're seeing, and then finally maybe give us a brief initial crack at what a more appropriate conceptual replacement might be. And uh, I know that's a lot, but we'll sort of, yeah, that's uh, a big, I'll, that, I'll prod you along. <laughs> that's a very big order. But, but before I, before I try to uh, get into that, I, I do want to add something that I didn't get to in my uh, opening remarks, which is that I have been a great admirer of your writing from the time that I first encountered it. Uh, you are, a very distinct, uh, distinctive figure in the movement to criticize and to bring about change in, in the whole U.S. military sphere, military intelligence sphere. And I, I just can't tell you how much I admire your uh, determination, I mean, the, the degree to which you work so hard at, at churning stuff out, I, I couldn't possibly match your your output um, and the intensity of your work. I don't think, um, and and that that causes me to really uh, uh, to really set a step back and and admire you uh, in in very in the most uh, most admiring terms is all I can say. Um, so I just want to say to tell you that to keep it up. Um, this is. This is what we need. Um, you are you are definitely part of uh, what has to be happening in this country, um, and and to to build on that is is really the name of the game. Um, so I just oh, I appreciate to- that. I mean, it's it, it, I'm just so happy to be part of the conversation and in the same movement as folks like you. And it's it's really nice to hear that. So thank you. You're welcome, uh, indeed. And and so just to come to the question of, of uh, the definition of national security, the the way in which it's been defined, uh, I presume that you mean essentially since the beginning of the Cold War, uh, since, since the, the, the present system actually began to unfurl, began to to form, right? I mean, it's, it's how the national security state has defined its mission. Um, and, you know, I think that there are two sides to this, to this coin. One side is the public side that is 
you know, the, the propaganda themes that are used by the national security state, which are that, um, you know, emphasizing that this is a dangerous world, that uh, the United States uh, is always facing threats uh, to our security, to the security of the American people, as well as to the international order that the United States founded at the outset after World War II, um, and, and which has kept the peace. I'm, I'm now using, you know, in quotes, the kinds, of, the kinds of language that have been put forward by the national security state over the years, uh, that, that this, uh, that this uh, U.S.-sponsored peace has been the one that has uh, kept order throughout the world uh, and is under threat now from our major uh, adversaries, particularly China and Russia, but also, uh, you know, the, the smaller adversaries of Iran and uh, North Korea. So, I mean, I, I think that kind of summarizes the, the formal presentation, if you will, of the concept of national security. But behind that, I think, um, is, is a very different um, reality in terms of how the national security state has defined uh, the interests of the U.S. government and by, by once re remove then the interests of the American people. In other words, they, the assumption is that the, the American people have the same interests that they do, which of course is not true. But the way I think they understand this is that they must continue to um, maintain the, the system of bureaucratic power and control over resources that they have um, that they have been developing over several decades now, uh, in order to be able to to carry out the policies and programs that uh, that they regard as necessary to defend those interests that uh, that they have pre uh, presented publicly to the American people, and so that that gets us into I think closer to the to the heart of what the the interests of of the national security state really are, um, and and I think the the essence of my approach, which which I hope to translate into a new a new book that will really present a very different understanding of uh, the, the U.S. national security bureaucracy, national security state, is that that the this conjuries of national security bureaucracies, the, the armed services, the, the Pentagon's uh, civilian offices, uh, you know, of course, the Secretary of, uh, Secretary of Defense on top of it, and the intelligence community led by the CIA, but including national security agency, um, and uh, also the newest entrants, the Department of Homeland Security, all these bureaucracies have their own uh, interests at heart, at the center of their function and and their primary duty uh, in effect, although not formally, not publicly, if, is to ensure that they can do to maintain or to increase their uh, their their resource base, the that which they get through congressional appropriations, by uh, by making sure that there aren't uh, any serious cuts in their appropriations, and if possible, to increase that. Uh, to to increase their their resource base, and this basically is is the primary motor, if you will, of the operations of the national security state, because that uh, really is the uh, is is the motivation for them to make sure that they uh, push for policies uh, programs that will have the result that they will get uh, will continue to be regarded as necessary that they'll have more legitimacy and that they'll have more power over these uh, public resources and so throughout the the, the uh, cold war and since the cold war uh, they have been putting forward uh, uh, strong recommendations putting pressure on presidents to adopt uh, policy policies that have resulted in a series of, of major wars and, of course, a lot of minor wars uh, and, and some continuing that 
are not intended to end anytime soon. Uh, and, and I would argue, and I will argue in my, in my book, that this is all the result of, of, of this, this dynamic that I've described of the, the, uh, this, this uh, coalition of, of bureaucracies uh, really being determined to maintain their control over resources and doing whatever is necessary to ensure that that continues. And in the process, what that causes them to do is to get the United States into conflicts that uh, continue the, uh, the need or, or maintain the, the alleged need for more resources uh, going to the military and the intelligence community. Um, and more, again, more recently, the Department of Homeland Security, of course. Uh, and, and thus, it's a self-perpetuating dynamic. And I think that's the essence of the idea that I want to get across. And I'll stop there and we can discuss that a bit. Absolutely. I, I think that the, the idea of this is a self-perpetuating machine or as soldiers in the bureaucracy of the military always call the self-licking ice cream cone, right, Kagan and exactly. uh, Henry? Uh, but but that I mean that people say that, and yet I think what you're doing is complicating it and contextualizing it. You know, it's more than a platitude; it's a way of life. It seems, uh, and so you know, before we get to you know initial thoughts and predictions and prescriptions are way more difficult than identifying problems in some cases, uh, although uh, people often do it without thinking about the problem in the first place. But before we kind of get into that, you know. What are you seeing uh, recently, both before and after, you know, the, the moment of pandemic right. that is showing fractures or obsolescence uh, in this system and, and, and potential that it might be ready to morph or, or change or be meaningfully challenged? Yeah, this is this is absolutely the crucial issue of the moment. I agree with you on that, Danny. Um, we, we really need to dig into it as deeply as possible. And, you know, my observation, first of all, is that that the coronavirus pandemic is uh, clearly the, the biggest potential moment of crisis for the national security state that they've, uh, that they've seen thus far. Um, it hasn't happened yet. It has not matured into a full-fledged crisis. But, uh, but as you suggested in your question, um, there, there are signs that, that they're, they're danger signs for them. Let's put it that way. And, and the first one is uh, really what happened with regard to the uh, Theodore Roosevelt uh, affair uh, when uh, a major U.S. Uh, ship in the Pacific or, you know, headed to the Pacific, it hadn't gone out yet, uh, was um, stricken by the coronavirus. And um, they went ahead with their plans to, to go ahead and launch, uh, to, to begin their mission. Um, and uh, instead of, of, you know, pulling back and saying, okay, you know, we were going to put taking care of the, of, of the pandemic um, and its impact on the sailors first, the Pentagon, the, the Navy specifically, tried to maintain the schedule and uh, essentially was resistant to, uh, to pulling back. And as a result, you know, every, I think all your listeners are very well aware of the storyline that the, the captain um, of, of the ship uh, had his, his plea for uh, really uh, taking uh, at least a thousand sailors off or most of the sailors off the boat uh, as soon as possible and getting them to a safe place uh, where they could be treated and, and avoid uh, a, a calamity of, of major proportions. And uh, that, of course, blew up in the face of the Navy, and we've now seen the result of that. And I think one of the uh, results that, uh, that is very important to, to understand is that the families of the sailors were not happy with the way the Navy dealt with this crisis on board the Theodore Roosevelt. Um, and it happened again with regard to the uh, uh, to, to another ship, uh, the name of which now is escaping me. They, uh, do you remember the, the there's another ship um, 
which which was having uh, coronavirus cases. And, right. Uh, I think it was like a destroyer or a cruiser uh, rather than an aircraft carrier. But the, I can't remember the name, but there was a follow on yeah, yeah. case. Absolutely. Uh, I've forgotten it for the moment. Um, but. But in any case, again, the families of sailors were upset with the way it was being handled because they were not testing the crew. Um, they were testing only those who had shown uh, basically coronavirus symptoms. And uh, it was not being handled in a way that was suggesting that they really cared about the health of the sailors first. And so, I mean, this is one of those fracture points, as, as I think you mentioned, that... Um, it has the potential, certainly, over time to mature into um, a bigger movement to to demand that the obvious primacy of the coronavirus uh, pandemic be given uh, appropriate weight by the Pentagon and the services. And I think there have been changes, of course, since since the um, Theodore Roosevelt crisis occurred. And I think they've been forced to, uh, to to somewhat pull back from the sort of all-out commitment to meeting their schedule for deployment and so forth. But nevertheless, I think that the um, the Pentagon and the armed services uh, priorities have been very clear that that they did not give prior uh, a primary um, uh, primary service to the health of their own soldiers and sailors. And, and I think that this is one of the things that should be taken into account by the public in terms of their understanding that things need to be changed fundamentally. And this, this happens against the background of the, ob the, the point that is obvious to, I think, just about everybody in the United States. I mean, there are exceptions, of course, but I think the overwhelming majority of Americans now understand that the only real threat to the security of Americans does not come from the Chinese or the Russians or the Iranians or the North Koreans, or for that matter, from even Al Qaeda. Um, those are, they all pale into insignificance in comparison with uh, this pandemic. And, and, you know, this is a pandemic which uh, you know, people who were familiar with the problem have been warning about for years and years. And, and you know, lest people forget, in 2015 and 2016, uh, beginning in 2009, actually, the United States has experienced a whole series of, of pandemics. And uh, so they have not, it's not the first time that this has happened. And, and they've been told that there's going to be a much worse one on the way for years and years. And they were supposed to have had a, a, a very detailed plan uh, at hand in order to deal with it. And of course, it didn't happen because of a neoliberal uh, sort of uh, approach to this whole problem that was had taken over not just under Trump, but under Obama. Uh, that, that basically the idea was that, well, we'll wait until we see the pandemic arise, and then we'll uh, then we'll go out and get the necessary uh, tools for the doctors, the nurses, uh, the the, fit, the ventilators, and the N95 masks, and so forth. And of course, that was stupid. I mean, because that's not the way it works. You have to have you have to be prepared ahead of time, and that's precisely the notion that obviously informs the Pentagon and the rest of the national security state. They, they prepare for wars that might happen 20, 25 years in the future, right? Uh, and which are very unlikely at that. But whereas in the case of a pandemic, they really didn't do anything to prepare for what they should have known was a very strong likelihood at some point in the near future. And so I think the lesson of this is one that should penetrate the political system and the society. So far, it really hasn't happened yet. And I'm waiting for, for that to be the, the real uh, test of, of whether we're going to get uh, fundamental change, not only in the political system in general, about this, uh, this whole issue of what national security is about, but but change in the structure and functioning of the uh, of the military and the Pentagon and the intelligence community, um, and and so far I have to say, 
uh, my hopes that fundamental change would begin to be felt have not been met. Um, and, and this brings us to another aspect of the problem, which is just how few resources we seem to have in this society for bringing about change. And I'm sure that's something that you are right. very familiar with and, you know, you'd, you'd be interested in having something to say about as well. Absolutely. I mean, I think the persistence in the face of pandemic of militarism escalation in certain places uh, like Somalia and potentially Iran, Iraq, at least in terms of plans, uh, has been really disturbing. So like you, I, I think I would describe myself as, as hopeful, if not optimistic, about the the chance here or the or the potential. You know, it, what was striking about the Crozier incident, the captain of the uh, aircraft carrier with COVID, uh, as well as so the response to that and then the response to this in general has been both a public one and a philosophical one. And I'd be interested to know what you think about this. So it sh has struck me in two ways. First, that the public, uh, whether it be the sailors themselves, their families, or just readers of mainstream newspapers, you know, it, it seemed that, you know, uh, two to one or more. Uh, they were favorable towards the captain and really disturbed by the Navy response or even the whole Pentagon response. And, and, and even though that may seem like a small thing or a one-off incident, I think that it, it has potential in the sense that, you know, if we can show, we being the broader movement and just folks who care in general, that look, not just the pandemic, but the forever wars in general are not in the interest of your sons and daughters and the distant American soldiers that you, you know, purport to adore, you know, that could have an effect. And then the philosophical one was more, you know, maybe less common, you know, people who are just focused on their jobs and living paycheck to paycheck and don't think about these things as much as you and I do. But for a lot of us, what seems more apparent than ever is that uh, no amount of aircraft carriers or missiles or tanks uh, in our current Pentagon structure is really going to be able to have any meaningful effect against the only two real existential uh, national security threats being either a pandemic or a new worse one or the just climate crisis in general. I mean, the only, the only use, it seems, of the aircraft carrier uh, at the moment of climate catastrophe is that they may be some of the last folks alive in their floating city. But I think so from the public and the philosophical perspective, I think there's been an exposure for corona and then i guess what i would be interested in is just in a general sense what you make of my assertions and then also you know what steps could be could be taken in order to reframe this to something more logical in terms of a national security posture yeah i mean i think uh, you know you you made a couple of uh, at least a couple of points which which were were coming down in a way on both sides of the issue some of it more uh, you know logically suggesting that that this uh, this could and should be the beginning of of a broader movement and and secondly that um you know that there has been uh, thus far still still no no uh, major major uh, outcropping of protest that um that that shows us that, that there's something that is underway already to bring about change and i, I think that we are in a situation where there th this is an enormous uh set of of contradictions between on one side the the obvious nature of the crisis that the society and therefore the uh, all the institutions that are part of the society uh, are, are going through and inevitably must cause a, uh, a kind of a, a crisis which we still cannot define the nature of. And, but on the other side, you have uh, a, a society that has been so subject to a uh, concatenation of power structures that have gained traction have gained control over all the major levers of power in the society for a number of decades now you have of course the uh you know the major elites the financial elite 
the healthcare elite and the uh, industri the military industrial uh, uh, elite, all having gained control over the levers of power, meaning that the both the executive branch and the uh, legislative branch have been essentially colonized by these interests uh, because they dispose of so much money that they essentially buy off uh, the the uh, certainly buy off the Congress. That's obvious. But but in a sense, they also own the executive branch as well. Um, and and so that that um, degree of power has been building steadily over the last four or five, six decades, and has accelerated really in the last two or, th uh, two or three decades. Um, th the second point I would make is that, that you know, uh, what, what everybody listening to, to your podcast already knows, that the corporate media are fully part of that power structure. Um, you know, they are owned by people who are directly connected with the financial elite. Uh, they are tied in fully with the uh, the other corporate elites, the the uh, healthcare elite and the military industrial complex elite, uh, to the point where, you know, they are ready to carry their water um, consciously and unconsciously, uh, so that any message that goes against the the interest that we're talking about here is not going to get through. And then the third point is that. I think, and, and in a way, this is perhaps most devastating, that, you know, you, you've had an atomization of the society in um, social and political terms. That, you know, you, you, know, you had uh, during the Vietnam War, and even at the outset of the Iraq War, a, a major anti-war movement that, you know, had millions of people in the streets, ready to protest. And uh, they represented a kind of moral majority in the country in a way. No, that's gone. That, that's dissipated. That's, that's been swallowed up by um, the, the social and economic trends of the past few decades. Um, you know, the, the, the younger people who were part of the anti-war movement have moved on to the sub Serbia, they've gotten jobs, they've gotten involved in other issues, they become part of the Democratic Party, they supported Barack Obama uh, when he was, you know, going to war all over the world. And, uh, and they've lost their fervor against war. And um, at the same time, you know, you, you've had uh, that the, the sort of uh, strong opposition to the wars be broken up into tiny fragments of ideological uh, points of view that involve lots of people who are subscribing to all kinds of weird uh, theories, uh, uh, theories about, uh, uh, you know, various people uh, and institutions and what they can accomplish secretly and uh, the, the, uh, the theories that have been uh, somehow used against a lot of people who are against the war, right? I mean, you know, the left has been broken up and fragmented. Uh, the right is on the rise. And uh, uh, and th this is all setting the stage, it seems to me, for a period during which there is simply no way to move forward politically uh, without some new factor that we have not been able to identify uh, arising, whether that's people uh, desperate for for food, um, rioting, uh, breaking into stores, creating a uh, a major civil crisis, um, that's that's the only thing that comes to mind that I can think of. And I'm just talking off the top of my head here, but but that's th those are my thoughts about what the problem that we face here and just how serious it is. Uh, absolutely. And uh, the fracturing of the left and the uh, squelching purposely, really, by Nixon, uh, by getting rid of the draft of the anti-war movement, although it was more complex than just that, has been uh, disturbing. And so uh, as I pivot over to uh, to Henry and, and force myself to shut up for a while, I think that though I don't subscribe to the conspiratorial 
thinking per se that this was planned in any way. It is convenient, of course, for any power structure that in the midst of pandemics and, and, and the social control that follows, it's increasingly difficult, if not impossible, to organize uh, if the will were even there. And, and clearly, as you pointed out, most disturbing, as, as you called it, the will has not been, or at least the mass will. Which, which really uh, bothers me. So, uh, yeah, so I think we're going to build on a couple more thoughts on the pandemic's relationship to this, and then, you know, feel free to jump in on uh, on anything, of course, that, that interests you as well, Gareth. Sure. <clears throat> so um, I wanted to talk a little bit about one of the responses uh, to the pandemic from uh, President Trump and the Trump administration. Um, in June this year, uh, the president is sl scheduled to give the commencement speech at West Point, despite other military academies doing a, a remote graduation or maintaining strict social distancing. And while we don't know if families or other guests will be permitted, what we do know for sure is that at least a thousand cadets will return from isolation and potentially expose themselves uh, to the pandemic along with the staff at West Point and the families, the communities uh, in the surrounding area. Um, Gareth, would you share with us a bit on the pandemic of 1918 and how the military was central to its spread? Um, and do you think an event like this, like this commencement, could create a huge new spike in infections, um, similar to what happened in Philadelphia with the Liberty Bond Parade mm -hmm. in 1918. Well, that's a very interesting question indeed. Um, and, and you know, the, uh, to, to the degree that the White House is serious about this, it is totally bizarre and, and just beyond belief. I, you know, it's hard to even imagine that somebody is so stupid as to do that. But We'll, we'll just hold off on that on that aspect of it uh, to go back to 1918. Um, you know, this this was a, a, a pandemic that did indeed, as you suggested, uh, underline the uh, even then uh, before the Cold War and decades before the Cold War, the degree to which the military had become an interest group which was set apart from the interests of society and, and really privileged its own interests over those of, of the society. Now, you know, to some extent, you could argue there were extenuating circumstances that they didn't fully understand or didn't understand sufficiently the, the degree to which this pandemic could take, uh, could, could have such devastating effects so quickly but I, I don't really buy that uh, because of, of a quote that, that I used in my story, which I'm sure you remember. Uh, the chief of staff of the army uh, who was dealing with uh, the, the general uh, in, uh, in Europe in, uh, in sort of supplying the, the bodies that, that were supposed to be sent by the tens of thousands across the sea uh, to be chewed up and, and lost in the in the war, um, he, you know, the, the chief of staff was saying that um, you know we. Uh, I think what he was saying was that we're. Uh, you you want me to read the question again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go back to the, where sure. We're no problem. No problem. So, um, could you share with us a bit on the pandemic and that? Could an event like the commencement create a huge new spike in infection similar to what happened in Philadelphia? Yeah, so um, the, the chief of staff was basically saying that, that um, he was going to deliver as many troops as was, were necessary, as were demanded by the, uh, uh, the command in Europe. But he was saying, you know, we do have a problem here at home. We have like uh, already, uh, I believe it was uh, 20,000 um, 20, people stricken by this and it's getting worse. Uh, so, so they understood perfectly well what uh, the, the cost of continuing the war without regard to its effect on the home front was. They knew 
that they were playing with fire. And that, that's, a, that's a very key point to underline here about the military uh, bureaucracy. Because even then, uh, during World War I, you had um, a, a situation where the military was, was privileging its own bureaucratic interests to fight that war. Um, and, and to do so in a way that satisfied its own version of what it was after. Uh, and even though, you know, there were more American soldiers actually killed by the virus than were killed by the war in World War I. I mean, you know, this is an amazing fact that people are not generally aware of. And, and it just shows that, that the U.S. military uh, then was, was ready to serve its own interests uh, despite the fact that it was harming, uh, you know, it was doing harm to, to the soldiers in a way that was uh, just just far beyond any reasonable uh, uh, sacrifice. And, and so there was a, um, there was a real problem here that, that the military was, uh, was seizing a degree of power that it shouldn't have had. And which, in a way, it, it forecasts what we've seen uh, during and, and since the Cold War uh, started. I was also thinking about the, um, the fact that so many leaders on our end of the war didn't want to share too much information about how the pandemic was affecting the military because of the nature of the war. That, that I, I want to say a comment in your piece about the, the German high command would, would not be, you know, they wouldn't be sitting down at the table to negotiate a surrender if they knew how many how much the flu was going around. Well, right, that's true. That's a good point. Yes, it it was it was a matter of uh, you know, they they knew how bad it was. Uh, we're hoping to keep it from the Germans. That's right. Yeah. So so they had to they had to play uh, a, a very nasty game with the American people just for the purpose of as you say uh, essentially deceiving the Germans. Yeah. So uh, following up on that a bit, how, how do you see this voting for the future of the military? U.S. forces in, in general, but especially the Navy, have shown their vulnerability to an outbreak of this kind. But because military units and operations are so compartmentalized, will American forces truly embrace any existential change here? Yeah, it's hard to, it's hard to know exactly how this is going to play out. I mean, the... the uh, U.S. Uh, military bureaucracy um, is is certainly they started out with the intention of trying to uh, to to go ahead without regard to the immediate human cost of the uh, coronavirus, but I think they've had to make some changes, obviously, in their in their schedule, in order to deal with what had become a, a pretty serious crisis and and to head off much more serious uh, uh, problems with their own family, with the families of their own sailors. And, and uh, uh, that, that may have caused them to at least make some, uh, some change in their expectations about how fast they can move. But even now, I believe that they are still trying to meet a schedule uh, for deployments, which is really quite unrealistic. And so there is still, I think, a lot of tension here between the bureaucratic interests of this uh, military industrial complex and uh, the, the uh, interests of the health of, of the soldiers and sailors. Um, and, and I think that still, we still have to see how that's going to play out. Uh, but, but I do hope that, that there will be more protest uh, against what has happened already and, and what may continue to happen in the near future. I think that's one of the salients here that offers uh, some uh, promise of raising issues which must be discussed uh, as a matter of, of high uh, you know, uh, intensity, extreme, extreme um, uh, need at this moment for American society uh, be because of the power that the uh, military bureaucracies have uh, in a society, and um, the, the fact that they have had their way so completely, uh, it's, a, it's an uphill battle. But I think we, we have to hope that there will be 
some disturbance of the peace, if you will, that will raise issues that will, will force a, a major debate. Now, I, I should add here that, that there was an article published a few weeks ago um, in which a former um, high uh, um, army general uh, who, was, who was the commander of U.S., uh, a retired army general who was head of U.S. forces or, or international forces in Afghanistan um, and a co-author were arguing that, that this coronavirus is in fact going to force major changes in the way in which the Pentagon does business. And, and they were suggesting that, um, that, that there were going to have to be uh, some cuts in the military budget, some serious cuts in the military budget as a result of this because of the major spending that has already been done. It still remains to be seen whether that's going to be the case, but they were raising the possibility that there was going to be a, a serious conflict between uh, the emergency spending that has had to be put forward uh, already with regard to the coronavirus and uh, the desire of the Pentagon to keep full funding, uh, more or less full funding, for its uh, next year's uh, financial, uh, for its next year's uh, fiscal uh, year budget. Um, so, so we have to see how that's going to play out. But I think some people are uh, actually expecting that there's going to be a real crunch here that uh, the uh, present administration is going to be forced uh, to consider uh, serious cuts in the military budget uh, for, for the next fiscal year. The guys and I love doing the podcast, being able to share our experiences in the military with allies and supporters means the world to us, but we can't do all the work. We need you to share an episode of ours with someone, anyone whom you might think could be affected by it. A young person looking to join the military or possibly parents advocating for a kid joining the military, conscientious citizens who care about the violence the U.S. wages in their name, advocates for women and people of color who understand the harsh environment the military creates for my minorities and inflicts on those same minorities across the globe, and anyone else you think might be affected by it. Please take a moment, share this with them. Now, our podcast is supported in a few different ways. First, there's Patreon, where we're blessed to have an array of wonderful supporters helping the guys and I pay for some of the podcast's expenses. Those who contribute $10 a month or more will be mentioned right here as an honorary producer of the podcast, helping keep you, our listeners, stocked with new episodes. But you don't have to contribute $10 a month to help us. For as little as a dollar a month, you can help keep us going, paying for hosting and storage fees, transcribing old and new episodes, promoting and expanding the podcast, and... More I'm sure I can't think of at the moment. So let's bring out these honorary producers. And they are Will Arenz, Fahim Shirazi, Henry Zamoda, Adam Bellows, Eric Phillips, Paul Appel, Julie Dupree, Thomas Benson, Emma P., Janet Hansen, Lawrence Taylor, and the Status Quo Podcast. Your contributions are wonderfully helpful to us. Thank you so much. However, if Patreon isn't your style, you can contribute directly to us through PayPal at paypal.me forward slash Fortress on a Hill. Or please check out our store on Spreadshirt.com for some great Fortress merch. And do understand that if you can't afford to contribute to us, that doesn't bother us at all. This is a hard time for everybody. And we just want to make sure that what we share gets to as many people as possible. And now, let's get back to the podcast. Is there, is there any hope that you see of infectious disease or disease outbreaks becoming an enemy that the military treats more dangerously than terrorism or major power conflicts and 
Um, just like, and exactly like what you were saying is that might that change be enough to help shift some of our massive spending towards a genuine and legitimately dangerous target? Well, I mean, the short answer is no, I don't see any hope of that. Um, I mean, uh, the military uh, industrial complex uh, is, of course, devoted to continuing to, to have resources be funneled into uh, their coffers, uh, which are for war and preparation for war. Uh, whereas, you know, this would require a major diversion of resources away from their own programs to somebody else. This programs because nobody's going to give the Pentagon or the armed services uh, uh, or the contractors, you know, the money uh, to play with in order to do something about, uh, uh, you know, pandemics. Um, so, so there's a direct uh, contradiction there between the interests of those who, uh, who've had their way uh, in the United States for so many decades and, and today still, you know, dominate completely the uh, the capture of resources politically in this country, and the interests of those who care about uh, the pandemic's problem. Uh, it's going to have to come from somewhere else. And the question is, what, what interest groups are powerful enough to essentially compete for the kind of influence that is required to, to force uh, that kind of change in um, spending priorities? Um, I mean, it's not inconceivable that something like that could happen, but at this moment, at least, there's no, there's been no real movement in that direction. And and you just ask yourself, where is it going to come from? What is the interest group that has the ability to shift public opinion in a massive way quickly um, through propaganda, uh, through you know? basically uh, getting messages out in an urgent way that are that are heard by billions of people. Um, and, and I think the, the, the you know, the, the question is, you know, the question answers itself. I mean, there, there's nobody on the horizon that can do that um, in a way that gives you any confidence that it can happen. I mean, I, I hope I'm wrong, but you know, that's, that's my very pessimistic reading for the moment, at least. But I'd be interested in how you guys see that as well. I mean, what, what's your take on it? I, uh, I was very surprised in doing research on the coronavirus when the pandemic first started, that the military didn't have any ships where their medical um, capabilities leaned at all towards infectious disease. The two uh, the two Navy ships, the hospital ships we have, the Comfort, and I can't think of the name of the other one, they're both designed for your standard kind of trauma wounds, you know, combat mm -hmm. zone type yeah. things. Right. But they're not designed at all for a pandemic. And the fact that following what happened with Ebola, that the Obama administration didn't attempt to do some kind of change in that is, is very exemplary of what we're all experiencing with this because they had they they were the ones that had the team they were the ones that that actually made some preparation before the trump administration took yeah. it away why was it more done then well I, I just i would just point out that although the obama administration did have those plans you're absolutely right uh they they also let the ball drop um, in, in the last years or last couple of years of the Obama administration, when they had the strongest reason, the strongest motivation, if you will, to uh, uh, to to actually purchase the goods that were needed to to refill the coffers uh, for these uh, these emergency goods that we would be needed in the uh, event of a pandemic like this. Right. Um, they they didn't do it. And that's because they were captured by this uh, uh, this neoliberal notion that uh, you rely on the um, you rely on the market. You do it through the marketplace. Yep. Um, and that was a that was a huge turning point, and and one that is that has drastic consequences. Has had and will have drastic consequences. I'm sorry to say. So so we are really up against it in terms of major uh, underlying. Uh, movements of power in this society that have taken place kind of under the, the radar, as it were, 
for most people, certainly, including myself, I admit it. I, I didn't see this until, you know, it was already a full-blown crisis, and then I had to catch up with the reality. I didn't know that it, this had happened. And and now we, we have a much clearer picture that, that these things have changed so dramatically, so radically over a couple of two to three decades that um, we are in serious trouble, the most serious trouble that a society could be in, in regard to getting out of this situation. It, it, the path out is simply not clear at this moment, to my mind. And I, I'm glad to have Eddie chime in and, and suggest that there's something that I'm missing here. I, well, I like to, um, I, I was lit, reading one of your recent articles where you were talking about the privatization of the military and yeah. specifically when it comes to drones. And uh, that's something that's kind of near and dear to my heart, um, having been involved in like operations, <laughs> including drones. And uh, it's just it, like, I love in the article you pointed out, you know, the, the dramatic increase of contractors over the last you know 15 years mm -hmm. and um and it just it was it, everything you said just reminded me of like being at work and you know i worked at an nsa building and so there was you know multi-service environments uh different contractors everything like that and most if not uh, most of the kids that i was in the navy with i would you know i would see them get out of uniform and then like two weeks to a month later they would be working in the building like wearing business casual because mm -hmm. of course they are because they're making twice to three times as much doing the no. exact same job. Yeah. And if you like doing what you're doing, then of course you're going to move on to that because that's a better option. But right. Right. it was just so frustrating to me because those people are not held to the same accountability standards as we are. And when it comes to even working within the like agency, um, when you're like assigned to an NSA shop or uh, you, <laughs> they don't have the same guidelines that, that we have as like being a part of the military or even being a part of the agency, like what the agency folks have to follow. So it like in this age of the fact that we doing person to person operations are going to be so limited. Um, I, I'm like, what is the next uh, best thing, of course, is drones. And we've already seen a crazy big increase over the fact of the Trump administration. But it just, I mean, that's what scares me the most is the fact that we're just going to continue to push, uh, we're, we're going to continue to push warfighting capability off of the military and to these private companies. And we're going to think in the neoliberal sense that, oh, this is better for us because blah, blah, blah. And yeah, it's yeah. just, it's, uh, it just frustrates me so much because it's it's uh, it's clearly not true. It's not working, and the fact that when they aren't held accountable to the same standards as us, to the same reporting requirements, to you know even just acknowledging um, the like effectiveness of their work, I think that is really damaging. And I think that might be one of those things that really gets people to start thinking about how we can change our perspective on this on this military industrial complex like when we have people who are doing the job of soldiers but they're not actually soldiers or sailors yeah you know are we gonna is that gonna help shift maybe our mentality as far as like hero worship i don't know <laughs> but, well you're absolutely right that that the uh, neoliberals uh, have have been able to um basically <laughs> get their get their way in, in regard to uh, the, the whole question of the Pentagon's operations. The uh, it's it's the people who are working for contractors who've filled more and more of the positions there. Um, and, and to the point where, you know, the Secretary of Defense didn't even know how many contractors were in his own office. <laughs> it was it was an insidious process that uh, had had taken had gone so far so fast that uh, you know the the people who were not part of the uh, private uh, contractor uh, uh, aspect of this 
didn't even really know what had hit them. Um, it, it had moved that fast. And, and the outcome is that, again, you know, private interests are, are uh, much more powerful than ever before. And, um, you know, the, the line between the private interest and public interest has now been muffled and, and you know, uh, is no longer clear. And as a result, uh, you know, I think we have a situation where uh, you, you can't even say that the Pentagon represents uh, anything but um, a coalition in which private interests are the dominant, uh, the dominant factor. Uh, and, and that's really going to be a central point in the book that I hope to write about this, uh, which I intend to write about this um, starting, starting right now. Um, I think that it's, it's not well understood, and it really does need to be understood by many more people, just how far the, uh, the, the military industrial complex has been taken over by and is uh, defined by private interests to the point where, you know, one person who was quoted some years back, um, you know, he, he was a retired general. He was, he was quoted as saying that, um, you know, the, uh, if, if we knew uh, just how, uh, how much influence the uh, private uh, sector has has gained has has gained over this. Uh, people would be very upset, um, and you know he had only recently come to realize just how how much the Pentagon was defined by uh, by private interests, um, and and that I think is uh, is a major weakness politically that has to be exploited and uh, brought out uh, in a much, a much more forceful way. Absolutely. Um, I, I think that the, the privatization aspect and um, the distancing of the United States from, or the American people in particular, from war in its operations, right? The, the new American way of war, which is really sort of a back to the future aspect is really, you know, it's disturbing, but it's of a piece with the strategy to maintain endless war. Uh, yeah. As you mentioned in the in the earlier sort of rejoinder about Vietnam as compared to the uh, anti-war movement today, you know, uh, it's it's kind of more invisible, and and it seems, and and I'd be interested in your in your thoughts on this. Um, you know, obviously the most is seemingly farcical, but I also think foreboding uh, aspect of this or recent aspect has been, of course, this coup attempt by mercenaries in Venezuela. But I, I would argue, and I'd be interested in your thoughts, of course, that this is sort of, you know, indicative of a new age of proxy war, which could, right. you know, only grow as a, a pandemic proxy strategy. But, you know, are we, uh, are we seeing that the elites, Democrat and Republican, neoliberal and neoconservative, are pulling back from even the Iraq-style occupation, which didn't garner the anti-war vehemence of Vietnam, but, but was costly and did cause a little bit of public turmoil. Or, are they pulling away from that? And is drones and privatization a, a core aspect of that? And will we see more of it? Yeah, I think, I think that um, the Iraq experience on top of the Vietnam experience, but obviously much more recent and much more relevant to the, to the calculations of the present generation in the Pentagon um, and, and the armed services. Uh, I think that it's extremely important in understanding the way in which uh, the, the, the people in the Pentagon think about the future of the military. Um, and I think that, that it is indeed uh, aimed at um, fighting wars in ways that uh, reduce the the human footprint relative to technology um, and um, ensure against uh, any future anti-war uh, movement arising. I, I think there's no doubt that there's a connection between those uh, between those uh, uh, earlier experiences and the the new 
way of war that uh, is, is, has been taking shape now for years. So to, uh, to, drill, to drill down a bit then to uh, a region or, or a case study that you've covered a lot, and um, you know, I'll ask sort of some specific questions, but it, I would encourage you in the tone and theme of this conversation to, of course, uh, where you see fit, build it into or thread it into this larger national security state. I'm interested in Iran, which obviously you've done a ton of work on. In some cases, you're probably tired of talking about. But it, it does seem that American military policy towards Iran, both planned and executed, because there's a gap, it seems, there, uh, is, of a, again, relevant to this larger conversation. So specifically, you know, your recent work on the collusion between uh, my buddy, uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, <laughs> Uh, who I admit I have a nemesis blind spot for, so take everything I say with a grain of salt. But between him and the somehow still Israeli Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu to you know gin up a war, it seems with Iran, uh, that your work on it has been striking. Uh, even though I'm probably more familiar with the broad strokes of this relationship and, and relevant history than most, uh, it still shocks me, and, and I truly think it should be front page news, like on the daily. And of course, it's not. Uh, so, with that, I guess, you know, what are the just brief realities of the Pompeo BB uh, nexus that make it so troubling and so uh, indicative or reflective, if that's the case, of the system we're discussing? Right. I mean, Pompeo, Pompeo, and Netanyahu are indeed the the dangerous combination that lurks behind. The issue of of U.S. policy toward Iran, um, and and the reason is that um, Pompeo, um, you know, as Secretary of State, has been the, uh, the the figure that has moved the policy consistently over the past year and a half um, toward the uh, cr crisis between the United States and Iran, uh, if not outright war. I mean, he, he has, in fact, carried out a couple of, of maneuvers that have, in fact, uh, risked, uh, carried a risk of, of war between the United States and Iran. I mean, the, fortunately, we have a president uh, who, who, who is not very bright, but instinctively uh, does not like the idea of going to war against Iran. He has no feeling that there's real, that there's a necessary uh, a necessary cause, a casus belli, if you will, between the United States and Iran, uh, Trump does or does not. And, and therefore, in the two instances uh, that, that have occurred, one, um, I have to stop and think now of the specific timing of this, but the first was, in, um, was, was last year, um, approximately... Um, Let's see now. I think it was the summer, and um, the you know it was a case where the United States um, had to make a decision where where the president had to make a decision about whether he was going to uh, uh, basically drop bombs on Iran uh, over the shoot down of a U.S. Uh, drone, and um, that was. One where you know, you had recommendation from uh, from you know his advisor to go ahead and go to war, and Trump almost did it, but then pulled back at the last minute uh, to to Pompeo's uh, dissatisfaction. Um, then more recently, you had a case uh, where uh, you know in January you you had the. Uh, uh, the recommendation by Pompeo for essentially bombing um, an Iranian target, um, you know, in in uh, uh, Iraq, um, and basically the the uh, president went along with it, but the Iranians were able to have the situation without essentially triggering a war. So you have here. Uh, a very dangerous combination of uh, Pompeo, who is uh, really doing his best to try to provoke 
uh, an armed conflict between the United States and Iran, uh, working closely with Bibi Netanyahu. And we know how close they have been uh, colluding with one another over the past year and a half and more. Um, and, you know, you have uh, a situation where the uh, president has thus far been able to avoid war, but it is, you know, he is subject to being manipulated. We know that he can be deceived uh, on occasion uh, if a clever enough uh, setup is maneuvered, a uh, setup, uh, you know, that seems to involve a situation that, that uh, most people in the United States might regard as a casus belli, then uh, he is he's tempted to listen to what Pompeo is telling him. And that's the real danger that we're up against here. I, I do think, in fact, that Trump uh, would like to avoid war, and I'm hopeful that that's going to be the case. But, but Pompeo, is, uh, Pompeo is definitely somebody who is very clever, knows how to uh, whisper in Trump's ear. Uh, I think he's very effective in that regard, and, and that's what makes him so dangerous. Um, on the Iranian side, I have to say that, uh, you know, uh, I have no doubt that the Iranians would like to avoid war with the United States. But if there is an attack on Iran per se, of course, they will respond and there will be war between the United States and Iran. I have no doubt. I think what you brought up is super interesting regarding, you know, it seems to me and and you have to be careful whenever you say this because of course the reflexive response is that you you know you love trump uh, or you love the islamic republic and but but it, i think that the record shows and you've written about this that trump has shown restraint of you know obviously assassinating the top general and political figure in iran was tantamount to war yeah. So this was yeah. abhorrent and unforgivable because he is the decider, as Bush would have said, George W. Bush. But in many cases, Trump has shown a degree of restraint on the Iran issue, despite being pushed in a number of directions and, and even some what could be called provocations, although there's a lot of backstory to them. So you've got Trump showing some restraint. And then I think you've got Iran showing enormous restraint sort of time and again. You know, even the, yeah. even the missile response at Balad and all this was... Yeah, I mean, it's difficult to know exactly what they're aiming for, but the Iraqi government was kind of in on it. I mean, there was enough warning, and, and they're, they're, they've really shown. It seems to me that Trump doesn't really want war. Iran is doing all it can to avoid it, largely. Uh, and yet we have Pompeo and, and Netanyahu who, who won't take no for an answer. And so, you know, thoughts on that, but also what's the end game for a Pompeo or a Netanyahu. I mean, what are these folks really after? What's the end game? Yes, okay, war, but why and to what end? Well, you know, we know for one thing that Netanyahu personally has for years uh, been arguing both pr uh, privately and publicly that Iran um, is is not strong enough uh, to, to uh, be able to threaten or or to consider seriously a retaliation of uh, that would would bring about a counter retaliation from the United States that could basically devastate its economy and its its entire military capability uh, he's been arguing that consistently for years and it, it seems that he does believe in that um, at least there's, the, you know, there's a reasonable chance that that's the case. And I would hesitate to, to uh, uh, make the argument against, against that assumption. Uh, I think it's, it's much more prudent to, to assume that he does, he does believe, uh, I think falsely, that he could get away with, uh, in, in conjunction with the United States, uh, with, with Pompeo, getting the United States to take a poke at Iran without suffering uh, you know, the, the a serious risk of a wider war. Um, and I think that's uh, at the root of this situation that you've been describing, that, that it's, uh, it's Netanyahu's overconfidence that he can mess around with Iran and Pompeo's uh, willingness to, um, uh, to do whatever Bibi suggests, because apparently 
uh, you know, he feels that uh, alignment with the pro-Israeli faction uh, in American politics is his ticket to a future president uh, presidential bid. Uh, I assume that that's the case. I think there's a lot of evidence to that effect. Um, and and so I think we have that uh, situation that that holds out serious risk of of a miscalculation here. Now, the the, the hopeful part of this situation, I would say, is that uh, I, I'm not sure that Trump is willing to keep. Pompeo on beyond his current uh, term in office. Um, I have a feeling that Pompeo may be gone, um, that he's not really <laughs> very happy with Pompeo at all, to say the least, and that he would like to see him replaced. I don't think he wants to do it during a presidential year, but once that's finished, uh, and assuming that he would be reelected for the moment, I think there's a very strong chance that he'll be replaced. That's interesting. You know, I hadn't thought enough about a post uh, administration Pompeo, you know, what role he would play outside the administration, whether he would stick around. You know, I, I'm often I'm not a Pompeo expert, although I'm dabbling and, and I know that you're not. Uh, I'm often left wondering if Pompeo is is really, you know, eschatological believes in the rapture, like he says in many of his earlier speeches at these uh, evangelical churches about supporting Israel and the, the world ending there. Is he more, you know, rapture guy or is he more like Machiavelli Mike? Uh, I'm, I'm on the fence about that. Um, and we can discuss it, uh, you know, but as we sort of wrap up or come full circle, I think you raised some things that tied in with an article I wrote and that I'd like to hear your comments on specific to this. So, okay, Pompeo is the top diplomat, <laughs> even though the State Department has been utterly militarized for a long time and especially under him. Uh, and he went to West Point and graduated in 1986. And Mark Esper is in charge of war, right? The defense, as we call it. And, and he went to West Point class of 1986. And I, and I found out through some research that so did a few dozen folks who were deep in the military industrial complex. But what strikes me more than just the details of what I uncovered, which I won't recount, is as we use the Iran case study uh, and as we look at who these folks are at the top and, and, and infused throughout the system. You know, I think some of the things you've brought up that I'd be interested in your thoughts on uh, are coming to fruition here, where we have this really disturbing and nefarious situation where, you know, Mark Esper, the classmate of Mike Pompeo, who was a lobbyist for Raytheon, which, uh, of course, makes the Patriot missile system, uh, as well as a few of their classmates who are lower ranking, who left, in one case, uh, the air defense artillery community and, and moved over to Raytheon. Uh, another fault, guy who also left the uh, air defense artillery community, which isn't responsible for the Patriot system, and then went to work for Lockheed on the THAAD system, right? The theater air defense system, similar sort of thing. And so what you have, it seems... In, in back to that self-licking ice cream cone, but in a dangerous way, is you have Pompeo ginning up the war that Esper will execute and probably in the end support, uh, all of which is to the profound, you know, pecuniary benefit of Esper's former employer, several of their classmates who work for Lockheed and Raytheon, and what's the output? Well, even if there's no war, the output already has been the Thad and the Patriot flowing into the Gulf to the Emiratis and the Saudis in these massive contracts and then physically actually being transferred over over the course of the last year. So, you know, what do you make of this? And, and, and we've covered it, but this to me with the Iran scenario and these figures, these human figures making history turn, uh, something's going on there that is just worthy of, well, of this whole conversation. Well, it is it is an important uh, question that you're raising. And, and by the way, I did have a chance to read your piece. I loved it. I, I took I took copious notes from it. Uh, I found a lot of interesting stuff that I intend to consider carefully in my own writing, uh, for sure. Because this is this is very good data f about the entire uh, complex and how it operates, um, and and the increasing you know revolution of the revolving door uh, uh, 
syndrome, if you will. But but what I do think uh, is worth considering here is that uh, that obviously these people, although they're all class of '86 <clears throat> and they all belong to a system which is headed in the same broad direction, nevertheless, each individual, of course, is after his own interests, um, and and you know the interests of Lockheed and uh, Raytheon and so on and so forth. Uh, are, are one set of interests, and Pompeo is on another trajectory, which you know is is obviously indirectly related to that. But his uh, trajectory involves obviously making a whole new set of connections that are uh, are not directly related to the contractor uh, interests per se, but rather to uh, major political interests that have political constituencies, broad political constituencies, including, you know, very specifically the pro-Israeli community um, in the United States. That, that's one that he has, you know, he hopes to have a lock on as a, as a basis for future presidential politics, and, you know, for good reason. Uh, and I think you're right to question, you know, how serious his commitment is to you know the rapture and all that sort of thing. I, I think it, I mean, he's a he's a political calculator, and this is undoubtedly primarily, if not exclusively, political, rather than religious. Um, but having said that, I mean, you know, I th I think the key thing is that he's on a trajectory that involves uh, pre preparing for a bid for for a presidential uh, election effort, um, whereas the other members of, of the class of 86 at West Point are hoping to get jobs in uh, the private sector or in the Pentagon or going back and forth between the two. So, um, you know, I think you've got two sides of that, uh, of that complex represented. And, and, you know, I think Pompeo uh, being the much more powerful one at this point uh, is, is attuned to a broader set of interests that are not necessarily obviously not in conflict with but are are are, are more um allied with with the religious community rather than with the business community uh in terms of the ones that that uh, the class of 86 has primarily been involved with so i would just differentiate between those two sets of interests absolutely i think that one of the things that's important in the work that you're doing and that and that on some level I'm doing in all my discussions of, of the MIC, which seems, you know, it inevitably comes up in anything I write about, is that, you know, we have to be careful, and I know that your work will, to be clear about what we're saying and to not fall into this idea that there is a vast centrally led conspiracy. Um, would that it were almost right it seems almost as though it would be easier to fight if there was you know a single head or a single series of colluding figures a cabal in a smoke-filled room that was making all this happen when like i sort of try to make clear in the piece because i was getting ready for for the attacks is look this this truly is systemic as much as that word is overused and has built ad hoc over a long period of time and, and involves a, a, a lot of overlapping uh, interests that in many cases, you know, uh, complement one another and, uh, and create layers that are difficult to get through. And so while there is a system, there is such a structure as the military industrial complex, it, it happened, if not accidentally, it happened in sequence and in phases and involves human beings, right? Actors, who are part of the human condition, motivated by their own sort of things. But, you know, I, I think what you're describing is so important because we are, we, meaning folks who raise the alarm about this, are too easily dismissed if we come off as saying that this is simple and it's just a conspiracy and, you know, yell like Alex Jones about it or something, you know, when in reality... I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. It's very important to understand this as a, as a market phenomenon, essentially. I mean, it's neoliberalism as applied to, uh, you know, the, uh, to the military uh, industrial sector. 
Um, and, and that means that it does operate uh, as a market um, uh, and, and is not centrally controlled. Um, it, it, it's, and, and you're right, it's, it's even more dangerous precisely because of that. Um, it's more dangerous in the sense that it's more effective and harder to cope with uh, uh, in political terms. Absolutely. Uh, That's what bothers me about um, neoliberalism is that it always tries to make us think that people are selfish and greedy and they just want whatever they want, right? So in order to for people to get any kind of thing that they want, they have to act in that same way. And it's patently false. Like everything we know about social science and psychology, neuroscience, we know that people are inherently social creatures and they are inherently generous. Like, yes, people exhibit selfish traits at times, but most of the time we work cooperatively because that's how humans got to where we are, right? And it just, it's been so frustrating to see neoliberalism like, it be, like wheedle its way into everything. <laughs> and now we have this, this idea where we feel like, Oh, what do we do about it? And we always, we always initially start with the individual. Like, what can I do? And like, I like that to an extent. I like the idea of like, yes, we need to be responsible for ourselves and we need to like take initiative, but we as individual people can only do so much. And when you're trying to go up against these big systems, we can't do that by ourselves. We have to do it as a group, as a movement, as an organized thing. And Oh, it just, it gets like, it's nice that we continue to poke these out, to point these out and to show like, hey, look at what's happening here. But it's like, I'm hoping that this virus will really push us. I mean, the people who are stuck in the right wing media vacuum, it's hard to reach them. But I feel like everybody else, you know, we can, we can push them and we can be like, no, the only way we can move forward past this is by doing it together instead of hunkering down and trying all this austerity crap, like trying spending some money in like on people. What a surprise. Well, absolutely. This, this coronavirus crisis is the ultimate test, uh, if you will, of, you know, the, the possibility of moving beyond a sort of uh, a selfish, um, uh, sort of selfish uh, model for how things should work and do work. Um, and, you know, I, I think we are all really riveted to this drama to see how this does, in fact, play out, because it's all important that, uh, that this does lead to a cooperative uh, mentality, a cooperative spirit uh, in American society and politics. That's the only way out. Absolutely. If if there's a gift of Corona, for lack of a better term, it does seem to be a degree of exposure of the system that's been in place, that's been operating as designed and failing according to its operations as designed, uh, which applies to, of course, our primary focus foreign policy, but the always related, always connected, never easily dismissed or bifurcated domestic component and, uh, and what I've really enjoyed about our conversation is the degree to which we've transcended those sort of boundaries and even been a little interdisciplinary, right, to throw out the academic terminology. So um, this has been great. We've, we've kept you now for a, a half hour longer than I promised, which is typical if you've ever listened to our podcast. Um, so with that, uh, Gareth, is there, um, is there something we're missing or is there somewhere you'd like to, to – and or was there somewhere you'd like to direct our listeners for your work uh, and things to sort of check out and be paying attention to? Well, I'm, I'm happy to let your listeners know that I have a new uh, home, if you will, in terms of, of publishing regularly. I'm now going to be contributing uh, uh, on a regular basis to The Gray Zone, uh, which is a up and coming, rapidly rising um, site that uh, deals with national security policy, foreign policy issues, uh, and uh, is has a uh, has a very strong uh, investigative orientation, and so it's very much uh, 
the kind of site that is perfect for, for what I want to write about. And I'm very happy to have this relationship with the Gray Zone and Max Blumenthal, who's the one who's started it and is the moving spirit spirit behind it. Absolutely. I mean, I'm a big fan of Max, uh, of this site. When you've been there a little longer, um, uh, perhaps you can uh, shuffle one of my better articles in Max's direction. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, it's it's a great site and, and everyone... Uh, who hasn't already started reading it uh, needs to check it out as well as so your columns there, some of the other writers and then your books past and uh, present and then, you know, future, because I think that the project you're working on has uh, such potential and couldn't be more timely. Uh, so, so Gareth, I want to thank you again for the generosity with your time uh, and your ideas and, and, and having what I think was one of our really cooler and, and more comprehensive conversations about, may be the most important topic in national security today. Well, it's a very great privilege for me to be on your show. I, I thanks, thanks so much to both of you for having me on. I appreciate it and, and look forward to uh, doing it again sometime. Absolutely. We will do it again. And uh, at the very least, uh, when that book is uh, coming to fruition, we're going we're gonna to say we talked about it first and we're going to have you back on for that, if not sooner. So uh, thanks again, Gareth, and we'll talk soon. Thank you. Great. Thank you. All right. Please correct my complete, you know, sort of lapse there in the middle. <laughs> uh, no worries. No worries. Henry is our uh, Henry actually jumped off uh, a, a few minutes back for an appointment. So I front loaded his uh, series of questions. But he's our he's our tech uh, guy. He's the he's the real brains behind the, the operation. So he's pretty good at editing and, and we'll we'll get that out of there. No problem. Great. And uh, yeah. Good. Good to have the chance to chat. Absolutely, so and uh, keep doing what you're doing, and uh, stay in touch, Gareth, uh, and yeah, for anything, up. and we'll we'll be in touch. All right, good luck. All right, great. Bye. You have a good one. We're on Twitter at Fortress on a Hill, and also at Facebook.com at Fortress on a Hill. You can find our main blog page and our full collection of episodes at www.fortressonahill.com iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Patreon, Spotify. You name it, almost anywhere you listen, we're already waiting for you. And hey, we're always in the market for more Patreon supporters. Please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com. And if you're not into giving us a monthly payment, think about giving us a couple bucks on PayPal. The link is in the show notes. Skepticism is one's best armor. Never forget it. We'll see you next time. And listen to my song I hope you'll pay attention I will not be